Oh, uh, well, well. Good afternoon again, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Green Shoots, brought to you by the team SFF, better known as the Singapore Fintech Festival. Um, most of you already know, my name is Gabriel, and I am almost always your host for all the sessions at Green Shoots. Once again, Green Shoots is a community initiative that we here at the Singapore Fintech Festival run on a near weekly basis throughout the year that touches on the spread of topics under the Fintech umbrella. The Green Shoots series is also proudly supported by Tomasing this year, who, by the way, are also proud supporters of the Singapore Fintech Festival 2021, right, happening at uh, the beginning of November. Now, speaking very quickly about SFF 2021, just a quick reminder, our agenda and speaker lineup is now live on the website. Tickets are also on the early bird sale right now, all the way till 8th of October, right? Just visit us at fintechfestival.sg to find out more about all our teams, which is really, really around Web 3.0 and how it affects financial services. Don't forget, this year, we're also trying to do things a little bit differently, creating a knowledge platform that's essentially for everyone in the fintech ecosystem. And now, on to today's session, right? It's a very special one because we're collaborating with the South China Morning Post, uh, I think more affectionately known as SCMP, uh, specifically on their recently launched annual China Internet Report. Now, following a period of rapid growth and innovation, China's internet sector has entered a new phase of development, right? There's several factors driving internet companies to evolve, including tightened regulations, an evolving IPO landscape, and most importantly, changing demographics. These issues are encouraging companies to look outside their established markets, such as Southeast Asia, pivot their business models, focus on new customer segments, and most importantly, adapting to shift dynamics to remain competitive. Right. The SCMP internet report looks at how these factors have been influencing Chinese tech companies and fintech companies right, to look outside established markets and comfort zones, pivot their business models, focus on new customer sex segments and adapting you know, all these shifting dynamics, you know, most importantly, to remain not only competitive, as I said earlier, but relevant. Presented for the first time in collaboration with Green Shoots, we welcome SCMP to share some deeper insights throughout the next 45 minutes on the China fintech scene and you know, get a bit of context about how these trends are affecting Southeast Asia. Without further ado, let's first hear from Mr. Gary Liu, who is the CEO, Chief Executive Officer of the SCMP South China Morning Post. Gary, all yours. Hi, I'm Gary Liu, CEO of the South China Morning Post. A lot has happened in the China tech space since last year. On the one hand, the underlying market continued to grow as the country added another 85 million internet users in 2020 alone. But on the other hand, listed Chinese tech companies have experienced a massive stock sell-off, losing over 1 trillion US dollars of market cap since February of 2021. That's more than Singapore's entire equity market, which is the biggest in Southeast Asia. So why did this happen? Following a period of rapid growth and innovation, the Chinese tech sector has entered a new phase with both push and pull factors forcing internet companies to evolve. Let's take a look at the three key trends that will be reshaping China's internet over the next year. China's tech industry has been hit by sweeping regulatory crackdowns since the second half of 2020. There was no shortage of headlines over the past 12 months, including the abrupt suspension of Ant Group's IPO, the record 2.8 billion US dollar antitrust fine on Alibaba, China's ban on Bitcoin mining, and the cybersecurity probe into Didi Tuxing shortly after its US IPO. By the end of July, the share prices of China's largest internet companies had dropped 30 to 50% from their peaks. The regulatory tightening is driven by Beijing's desire to better align the country's technology development with national strategic goals and public interests. The increased regulation has four main areas of focus, antitrust, fintech, data protection, and cryptocurrencies. But why? Let's go through these one by one. First, antitrust. China's internet industry is dominated by several tech giants. In some sectors, the market concentration is even higher than that in the United States. For instance, the top three players in China's e-commerce sector command 84% of the market, compared to 51% in the US. 
In food delivery, 98% of the market belongs to the two largest players. Ride hailing is also dominated by two players with a combined 92% market share, where Didi Tuxing claims the vast majority. Big tech's significant market power has led to monopolistic behaviors, like heavily walled gardens. Taobao is an e-commerce platform owned by Alibaba. WeChat is a messaging app owned by Alibaba's competitor, Tencent. Users are not allowed to share links from Taobao on WeChat. Imagine not being able to share a product link from Amazon on WhatsApp. Conversely, Alibaba often forces merchants to list products exclusively on their platforms in a practice known as picking one from two, threatening complete removal if merchants were to sell across multiple channels. What regulators are trying to do is to stamp out these monopolistic behaviors. Second, fintech. Fintech companies like Ant Group have been using big data and algorithms to facilitate borrowing by consumers and small businesses, but they contribute only a tiny fraction of the borrowed amounts, while most of the funding comes from banks. Such lending facilitated by fintech companies ballooned to over 500 billion US dollars in just five years. The government considers fintech to be fueling excessive borrowing and overspending while bearing little of the liabilities. Therefore, it is now working to bring fintech under the same regulations as banks. Third, data protection. China previously lagged the EU and the US on data protection laws. Yet, public concern on rising privacy violations and the authorities' growing unease about the data practices of tech firms have accelerated legislation. Following the 2017 cybersecurity law, China passed a data security law in June of 2021. The personal information protection law is also expected to be finalized in this same year. China's legal regime on data protection is closely modeled after the GDPR, although it provides stronger protection of individual rights against corporations over state organs. Lastly, cryptocurrencies. Bitcoin mining consumes a significant amount of electricity. And China used to be the largest country in terms of Bitcoin's mined and hash rate. At its peak in 2019, it was responsible for 76% of all the mining activities in the world. That share has since declined. But if we treat all of the Bitcoin activities in China as a city, Bitcoin would still be the ninth most polluting city in China in terms of carbon emissions before the crackdown. The environmental impact of crypto activities runs afoul of China's goal of achieving carbon neutrality by 2060. Separately, China is also keenly concerned about financial security and graft, as crypto has the potential of circumnavigating the country's strict capital controls. Chinese tech firms are facing increasingly difficult decisions on where to list their shares. Although the U.S. is still a preferred IPO destination, thanks to its deep capital pools and flexible listing rules, the threat of forced delisting from the U.S. is growing for Chinese companies due to the strained relationship between the two countries. As a result, we're seeing more secondary listings in Hong Kong as businesses seek to hedge against the risk of delisting. Newly public companies have also benefited from the relaxation of listing rules at the Hong Kong Stock Exchange. The Chinese government's recent cybersecurity reviews into U.S. listed companies, including DD, and tightening scrutiny over future overseas listings are also further complicating the matter, leaving some startups' overseas IPO plans in tatters. The demographics of China's internet users are constantly evolving, creating new niche customer segments for internet companies. But in China, niche is enormous. The silver economy, the Xi economy, and sinking markets are now three of the most heated battlegrounds for businesses vying for growth. First, China has 264 million citizens aged 60 or above, but only 42% of them are now using the internet. This means an untapped population of 153 million, which is around half of the entire U.S. internet population. As COVID-19 boosted the internet penetration among China's seniors, internet companies are eyeing the huge potential of the silver economy. Senior-friendly versions of mobile apps have been developed, featuring larger font size and simplified interfaces. Some even come with voice commands and screen reader functions for the visually impaired. 
Existing apps are carrying more content targeted at senior users. For example, short form video platforms like Douyin and Kuaishou regularly promote elderly influencers. There are also new apps that specifically target seniors. As an example, Tangdou is an app that creates an online community for China's middle aged or elderly square dance lovers. Second, a generation of well educated, financially independent, and confident female consumers in China is propelling the growth. Of the so called she economy. They are spearheading changes in consumption preferences with an increasing emphasis on personal characteristics and quality life. Take food and beverages as an example. Female consumers are pursuing healthier eating habits, lifting the demand for low carb, low fat, and high protein snacks. There's also rising consumption across different categories of alcoholic drinks. More interestingly, traditional Chinese snacks are also experiencing resurgence among female consumers. Last but not least, internet companies are tapping into the underpenetrated sinking market. Chinese cities are categorized in tiers, with Beijing, Shanghai, Shenzhen, and Guangzhou being the tier one cities. The term sinking market refers to the market of tier three or below cities and rural areas, which together represent 78% of China's 1.4 billion population. One of this year's hottest business trends is the targeting of the sinking market for community group buying. Which pulls together residents to purchase groceries and other daily essentials in bulk at a discount. In 2020, community group buying was boosted by the COVID 19 pandemic shutdowns as people turned to online grocery shopping. The transactional value of community group buying in China more than doubled from a year ago. Chinese tech and internet companies continue to impress with their growth and innovation, but they have now also <clears throat> entered a new phase of change. Given the sheer size of China's internet sector and its intertwined relationship with the global financial system, how these companies navigate evolving regulations and market fundamentals will have significant implications for the entire world. Hi, I'm Gary. Muted. Yes, I got muted. So sorry about it. Technical difficulties.、Uh, sorry, ladies and gentlemen. What I wanted to say was actually quite important.、Um, if what Gary said just now probably had quite a bit you know, to basically untangle and digest and everything. But if you look at it right, right now, right in our chat function within Zoom, you'll see that you have、um, links where you can actually download the full report. Right. So, for those of you who essentially want to take an entire weekend just digesting it,、uh, if you like, you want more, there's obviously a pro version that you can also uh, download. Uh, you know, you'll pay a fee for it, unfortunately, or fortunately,、uh, depending on how you know, you know, important it is to you. But if not, you know, next up, we actually have、uh, Eugene Tang, who is the business editor of South China Morning Post, who's actually going to share a small snippet. And walking through some of the key insights we have actually picked up from the China Internet Report, specifically those trends that are important for Southeast Asia. Oh, by the way, today's session also has the Q and A function. So again, if you go at the bottom of your screen, you will find a Q and A where essentially you can send in your questions. And when Eugene is done with his presentation, I will basically be picking out a few questions that Eugene and I will cover at the end of his presentation. Without with that, Eugene, it's all yours. Thank you very much. Hi, Gabriel. Thank you so much for the opportunity.、Um, hello, everybody. Good afternoon.、Um, the presentation by Gary actually summed up the China Internet Report very well. But、uh, like Gabriel said, there's a lot of information to unpack, and I will try my best to give you a little bit of a context、uh, as to what the numbers represent, and hopefully reserve some time to answer some of your questions. First of all, let's、uh, run with some numbers.、Uh, I'll show you of the first slide that gives you a snip snapshot of China's internet、um, industry versus the United States, the two largest economies in the world. As of the end of 2020,、uh, China had 989 million internet users for a penetration of roughly 
68% out of a total population of 1.45 billion. By comparison, the United States uh, with uh, 310 million users had 93% market uh, penetration out of a total population of about 333 million. So obviously the penetration in, in the United States was higher, but in terms of absolute numbers, China was more than three times the size uh, of the US in terms of internet population. When it comes to mobile internet, numbers were similar, 986 million for 68% market penetration in China versus 84% market penetration or roughly 280 million uh, in the United States. And the third figure, which is, uh, which is relevant to those of us who are interested in FinTech, uh, bears noticing. Um, people may not realize that China is actually the world's largest uh, market for mobile payments. So as of 2020, uh, 853 million people in China use mobile internet, sorry, mobile payments, uh, as opposed to 92 million users in the United States. Now, um, these numbers, uh, as Gary said, are gigantic. Uh, there's a niche market in China and the niche is a gigantic market size. If we look at the second slide, uh, the next slide will show you some of the major trends uh, that um, affected the internet market as well as fintech. Now, 2019, late 2019, early 2020, of course, was the beginning of the coronavirus pandemic. And uh, two years of, the, of lockdowns, um, companies uh, going out of business or people working from home have created two trends. The first trend is that people were consuming uh, online more and more. People did a lot of their shopping, a lot of their entertainment, a lot of their purchases online. And through that, they had to pay online. So the mobile internet and mobile payment market in China overall grew tremendously. That was the first major trend that happened. Then the second trend that happened that affected the, 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 the market was um, the beginning of the regulatory crackdowns uh, on the internet, especially the big tech companies. Now this crackdown has to be put in a historical context. The historical context is that China's internet industry grew in leaps and bounds over a very short period of time. I believe most people on this call will be familiar with WeChat, uh, the super app that almost everybody in China is um, using. Now you may not know that WeChat was actually, actually kicked off in 2011. So it is a, an app that has grown to a billion strong in the space of 10 years. Alipay, uh, which is operated by N Group, which is an affiliate of um, Alibaba, which owns this newspaper, um, is actually, was actually started in 2004. But the, a lot of the payments, a lot of the um, uh, additional services didn't come on to Alipay until around about uh, 2014 or 2015. So these are all fairly uh, recent phenomena. These are all fairly new developments. And the Chinese regulatory framework simply did not catch up until these um, organizations, these services grew very, very big. And the next slide, will, we can show you how big they've become. Um, if you compare China and the United States, you compare the uh, big uh, fintech companies in China versus the United States, you can see that the Chinese fintech companies uh, exemplified by N Group, uh, Tencent, uh, JD.com and Baidu, all these services permeated every single aspect of financial services, from banking to the provision of consumer loans and credits, payments, which is the sort of the core, um, core product, if you will, of, of these, uh, of these uh, services, to crowdfunding, even to asset management and insurance. So they run the entire gamut of financial services, unlike in the United States. All that happened in a very short period of time. So it took time for Chinese regulators to catch up. It took time for the financial regulators to appreciate and understand what the potential impact is on the financial system. So as a result of that catching up, they decided to um, take a fine uh, tooth comb to comb through 
the entire fintech industry. And as a result, a lot of the companies, uh, including uh, N Group, were told to um, uh, restructure the businesses so that um, in, in a way of saying uh, whether fintech should be uh, managed like banks or technology companies, the um, regulators decided that fintech companies ought to be regulated by bank, like banks. So in other words, they needed to put in uh, risk management tools, they needed to put in uh, very strong compliance regulations, and they needed to put up more capital uh, behind every dollar that they lend, right? So that they are like more like banks instead of uh, technology companies. Um, the next slide will give you a, a sense of the next trend uh, that took place uh, in the last couple of years in, um, in um, China's fintech industry. So the significant involvement of fintech uh, in all manners of lending, um, non-cash retail payments, et cetera, have raised um, regulatory flags. Um, they required fintech companies to set up financial holding companies to, 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 to manage these companies. Um, if we go to the next slide, um, we can see that uh, 2018 was the sort of the high water mark for fintech investments in China. Uh, a total of $29 billion uh, were invested in the, in, in the sector as uh, venture capital, private equity, all rushed into the sector to provide all manners of um, uh, financial services through mobile internet. Everything from lending to crowdfunding to um, you name it, to the prov provision of uh, credit information. Uh, everybody was basically jumping into fintech at that time. Um, and then of course, uh, in uh, 2020, the uh, crackdown and the um, overhaul of the industry uh, took place. Um, another trend to, um, to, to point out, and I apologize for the um, small writing on this uh, rep uh, report because it's not made for sharing like this. Um, if I can look at uh, slide five, um, the number of uh, the next slide and the next one and the next one. Yeah, that's one. Um, you can see that um, a number of uh, foreign fintech companies had entered China over the past few years. Um, PayPal, HSBC, Allianz, at the same time, a number of um, Chinese fintech companies have gone overseas, especially to uh, Southeast Asia. Um, N Group, uh, C, Futu, uh, UP Fintech, all these companies have uh, begun to uh, venture overseas, uh, investing in startups in all over the world. Um, one of the main reasons is because uh, the, the market, uh, the domestic market in China is extremely competitive. Um, uh, especially when you've got the, the, the likes of uh, Alibaba and Tencent behind a lot of these kinds of ventures. Um, these are market, these, these are businesses where the winners take all. And uh, as Gary alluded to in his uh, video presentation and something which is re we've reported in the China Internet Report, the biggest players in the market took up um, the lion's share of the, of, of the market, which leaves very little for uh, little scraps for uh, new startups to, um, to, to fight over. So as a result, a lot of these companies have had to uh, venture overseas to, to, to look for uh, green fields. So Southeast Asia, the next slide shows that uh, Southeast Asia became a very lucrative alternative to a lot of um, uh, Chinese fintech companies. And big tech was uh, expanding. The next slide will show that the big tech was uh, recently expanding in Southeast Asia. For example, establishing in Singapore, uh, Alibaba, our parent company, um, uh, took stakes, uh, ByteDance, uh, Tencent, they all started offices and uh, massively enlarged their presence in Singapore to uh, expand into the local business. So these are some of the, the major trends uh, that have taken place in the uh, uh, fintech, fintech industry. Um, and the regulatory overhaul continues. 
and it has uh, spread from fintech to other aspects of the internet industry. Over the past few months, we have seen the government uh, cracking down on uh, everything from uh, data uh, privacy and, and data consumption to uh, online gaming, to um, education, um, so all these um, uh, efforts that are still currently in play. Um, so uh, the internet industry in China is obviously going through a very um, tumultuous and challenging period. Um, so I will take a pa I will pause for now and see whether you've got any questions. No, I don't think so. Uh, we can carry on and we can do a Q&A for this. Right. So, right. oh, yes, that's the um, end of my um, few slides. Um, if you want to get a uh, download the, the short version of the China Internet Report, you can scan this QR code. Uh, the short version, I think, is uh, runs to 58 pages. There is a longer version that goes uh, deeper into, uh, into the weeds of the numbers, uh, including some very interesting uh, case studies. Um, we interviewed a number of um, uh, opinion leaders and uh, key internet entrepreneurs. Uh, they are active in the China uh, internet scene. Uh, that full report runs to over 100 pages. And uh, if you like, you can also uh, download that for a, a small fee. You can scan the QR code there. Right. Um, thank you very much, Eugene. And um, I think it's time. Let's just do a quick 15, 20 minute uh, Q&A with regards to, you know, everything that's happened, everything you've shared. And Eugene, thank you very much. So before we go into the essentially the, the questions, and I think questions are slowly coming in from the audience as well. Um, I just wanted to get a little bit of a, and for everybody, by the way, uh, if you've got any questions, please put them in the Q&A box. Uh, you can find that at the bottom of the screen if you're in Zoom, right? Um, all right, actually, first question, I, I just want to try and get an understanding, and I think everybody has this question as well, which is that a lot has happened in 2021 when you talk about China and you talk about the Chinese internet seed, right? Obviously, the Chinese internet report just came out literally a couple of weeks ago. Where and how do you see, you know, this, this, this Chinese internet trend going in the next three months with regards to all the, either the crackdowns, obviously you've got um, the different companies being told by the government to break up and everything like that. If we have this conversation again in December 31st, right, figuratively speaking, where do you think we will be and where do you see that moving towards, um, given all the coverage you guys do in China? Okay. Uh, thank you for the question. I think, again, uh, let's go back to the historical context uh, of all this. China's internet industry uh, grew very, very rapidly in a very short period of time, right? Um, it's it, the speed of growth and development and the number of um, applications and uh, the, the traffic is generated, the number of the, the amount of money, the amount of wealth that was created, uh, the number of people who have embraced a lot of these services all came at a much faster rate than what the regulators are able to um, envision. Right. So in the Internet industry, uh, things were moving at Internet speed. So megabytes per second. Uh, but regulators being who they are, bureaucrats move at uh, is, still live in the analog uh, analog, analog uh, age where they're moving at the pages per, per day. So um, it will require some time for them to catch up to the entire um, gamut of services and industries that are affected by the internet. So they've begun to take a look at this sector by sector, starting with the FinTech uh, industry. Uh, that was no accident. Um, one of it was because also because uh, N Group obviously is, uh, was trying to kick off uh, the world's largest uh, IPO at that time. But also FinTech uh, touched the banking industry and that cuts to the bone of China's financial system financial stability and the Chinese government is all 
anxious about maintaining uh, stability in the society. So they started with um, the big te fintech industry. Once they started combing through the uh, fintech industry, they discovered that there were other aspects of the broader industry uh, that were also affected. Uh, there's, there's the whole question of data, data privacy, the use of data, and, uh, and, and this is something which is unique to China, which is different from uh, US and Europe, uh, the whole question of data sovereignty, right? Um, unlike uh, the US and, and, and Europe, uh, China is particularly concerned about data sovereignty. So this whole issue um, require the, 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 the um, uh, regulators to take a deep look at how internet companies, you know, uh, whether you're a right hailing company, you're a food delivery company, you have uh, maps, you have got data, you collect data from your customers. How is that data used? How is that data stored? Where is that data sent to? All these questions uh, had to be answered. And after the, that, that sector, there was the sector of uh, gaming, right? How much time are uh, are the, 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 the young kids of the country uh, spending on games? Is that acceptable? Is that good? Is that bad? Um, that has to be answered and then, and so on and so forth. So a short answer to your question, uh, what will happen in the next few months um, will be that uh, things will continue to evolve. Um, the rules will continue to be uh, solidified uh, as the regulators come to grips with what how the entire um, society has changed. Um, they will have to come to grips with how the internet has affected and upended basically every aspect of, um, of our daily lives from you know, FinTech right through to gaming, to consumption, to education, and there'll be more, right? So- um, and, and, will... and do you and do you think, uh, just to jump in very quickly, Eugene, thank you very much, but, um, very, and I'm going to tie this in with, um, I think there are literally three people um, in the Q&A that's asking a full-on question. So I'll jump, jump straight to that very quickly, which is, is this then in the short to mid term going to restrict and inhibit innovation in the fintech space? Let's put it this way. Um, you can say, you can, you can simplistic, we can simplistically say that um, China's internet industry grew to where it is now in a wild, wild west of China's internet industry, right? There were very few rules. There were very few laws. There were very few restrictions as to what internet companies could do, right? Now the rules are up. Now the uh, rules of the game have been set. If you, are a, if you are Alibaba, if you are a truly innovative company, you know how to navigate those rules. You know how to play by those rules. And China's um, population is large enough, as we've shown in the very first slide. The number of uh, mobile internet users is large enough that you can very easily, in a very compressed time frame, be able to develop a very sizable business, even with those rules and laws. It's not a zero-sum game. It's not as if once those laws are up, out goes uh, uh, innovation, out goes creativity, out goes the internet industry. It's not like that. It's just that 12 months ago, or rather 24 months ago, you could argue that there were very few rules. People, you know, people were just uh, develop as you go along. The, 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 um, um, and businesses just grew very, very quickly overnight. And uh, now the rules are in place. And if you are truly innovative, you can work your way, way, way around it. So basically, to summarize it very quickly, you're saying that once the dust has settled um, in terms of reach you know, and profitability, everything, I wouldn't say go back to normal. It's just, it just will have a very different outlook, basically, in, say, 12 months' time. But that doesn't mean that there's no money to be made, innovation is not possible, and, you know, you, you should not, you know, in context, be a fintech startup, or, or you shouldn't be a tech startup, essentially, in that way in China. Correct. The, the, uh, again, the, 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 um, um, you have to appreciate a couple of things. One, um, the Chinese population have a great affinity to technology. They embrace everything that is new, everything that is uh, different very, very rapidly. Um, China's banking industry basically just completely leapfrog 
the credit card, the, the entire credit card business basically just leapfrogged it. So it just went from traditional bank accounts, savings accounts, and, and cash, cash payments for everything straight through to mobile payments, right? Because, uh, because the smartphone was ubiquitous and, and everybody was using it, right? So it, it did so very quickly. And everything else from you know, telemedicine to um, online education to online um, purchases of uh, property, uh, that could all be done uh, via Taobao. So that, was, so, so that was possible. So I think going forward, um, true innovation can still take root in China because the population is large enough and the population is, uh, has a great affinity to embrace all that is new and different. Nice. So I'm going to combine, um, actually, there are, um, again, uh, there are a few friends of ours, actually neutral friends of ours, um, actually in this chat right now, and they're asking questions. So I'm going to combine their question together with a question I wanted to ask. So my first, first part of the question is that, um, and I do not want to get into liberalism a little bit too much, but, um, and I think it's something, uh, Eugene, we discussed a couple of days ago as well in our prep call, is China doing the right thing, right? And I think the reason I am asking this is that I think China has had a very good view of what has happened and how, you know, like the internet has evolved in the perceived Western world, right? And maybe they've seen what has happened and they've seen, you know, its shortcomings, they've seen the, you know, the delayed reaction sometimes to certain things. And, you know, they, they, they see certain trends, you know, happening in China. And before things get out of hand, they are like, okay, we've got to have a hard hand to it. I think I use a Mandarin quote, which I say, right? Like, you know, short-term pain for long-term gains kind of thing, right? And, and is it really that, kind of like holistic approach, are we even looking at it correctly? And I think the second part of the question is that with that in mind, right, is there a way where whichever industry you're in, whether you are in the fintech space, your tech space, you're an investor or, or you know, a PE firm, you know, looking to get involved in the IPO game, et cetera, et cetera. What exact, is there a way you can find out in advance, you know, the direction of the policies, the government, uh, the Chinese government is going to implement, um, you know, relating to all industries relating to the internet, from the hardware to the software to the service providers and everything. Is there even a way to, to predict this? Because I kind of get the feeling that everything that's happened in the last six months, maybe people anticipate it, but, you know, they didn't expect it to happen so quickly, if I'm right to say, what do you have to say? Wow, that's so, uh, the second <laughs> question is very difficult to answer. Um, but first of all, congratulations on, uh, on the tiny saying. Uh, that's exactly right. Um, I wouldn't pass judgment on uh, whether this is um, what the Chinese government is doing is right or wrong, but I'll try to explain the context uh, of why it's done, it's done so. Um, uh, the Chinese government sees the internet fundamentally in a different way that um, the rest of the world sees the internet, right? They see uh, information and data fundamentally in a different way from the rest of the world, the way the, the rest of the world treats data and, and information. That's the first um, point that we have to appreciate, right? Once you appreciate that, then uh, you would sort of understand why information and data uh, cannot be unconstrained. It cannot be used in an unrestrained manner. Uh, it is a part of, uh, in, in, in the words of um, uh, uh, Chinese President Xi Jinping, and this is very important, it is a factor of production. There are very, very few people in the world, uh, in the internet industry, who, con who thinks of data as a factor of production. Uh, if you look at, if you go back and look, study political economy, uh, labor is a factor of production. Now China sees data as a factor of production, right? That's fundamentally different from how you and I and the rest of the, uh, a lot of other people who are, you know, who are familiar with the internet sees data. So and, ooh, let's, let's appreciate that. Um, having said that, 
um, that that's the direction that the, the Chinese government wants to take. Um, they 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 embrace uh, all that is new, um, but data has to be used to serve the greater good. And the greater good is to uh, eradicate poverty, uh, uplift the standard of living uh, uh, of everybody, uh, make banking easier in the rural area, which is why um, 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 Gary's uh, video mentioned uh, the sinking markets, right? The, 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 the third tier and the fourth tier cities where uh, people are underbanked. So data, mobile payment will serve those markets. Those data will be useful for that mar market. But all that has to happen within under the rubric of social stability. You cannot have a system or, 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 or service that disrupts social stability. And anything that threatens um, banking stability, uh, the, abil the affordability of education, for example, uh, children spending too much time on games and therefore affecting their homework, affecting you know, uh, fam family harmony, all that is something that um, runs contrary to the overall concept of data and information being a factor of production. It sounds like a very parental approach, if, if I can say so. It's a very Chinese thing. You, know. you said it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and and um to and and on to that point as well. Obviously, you know, no matter what everything we've discussed in the last you know forty minutes or so, one cannot deny the opportunities in the Chinese market. I think it's something you know everybody who's listening and the both of us uh, you know cannot disagree on. Right, opportunities are still here. So, you know, what's the approach then? If I'm a Singapore fintech company, right, or I'm a startup or anything like that. Um, should, should we still consider China now or should it be a 2022 conversation? Um, is partnering up still the best way forward? Um, or should we, you know, and I think some people gave this comment as well, should we ride on the coattails of the Chinese fintech companies coming into Southeast Asia and collaborate with them instead? Um, I know it's a very vague question, but I think what everybody wants to hear, it's kind of something that's relatable to them when it comes to business expansion. It's actually two questions, right? The first question is what uh, you should do in China, right? So I'll answer that first. Uh, again, we're talking about a 1.45 billion strong population, almost a billion users on mobile internet, right? So if you talk about a, a niche market, the niche is gigantic, right? Uh, again, the, the population compresses the timeline it takes to develop a lot of things. Uh, in Singapore, uh, how long does it take you to build up, uh, I don't know, let's call it 250,000 uh, users in, in, a, in a new app, right? Compare that with how long it will take to build up the same number of users traffic in China or in a, in a second tier city in China, right? The, the difference is night and day. So the opportunity is there. If you have the right, right product, the right uh, setup, uh, the right app that, that solves a key problem in China. So uh, to, the answer to that first question is come to China, take a look, spend some time, immerse, find out what are the major problems that need to be solved uh, for users. Come up with a product, come up with an app that solves that problem. And you have a, you have a gigantic niche market. The second part of the question is whether or not you should write on the co coattails of um, Chinese fintech companies going to Southeast Asia, right? Now, um, a lot of these Chinese companies, they uh, bring with them the uh, business model that, is, that was created, that grew out of the Chinese context. Um, in one of the earlier slides that I showed you, I showed you the... Um, number of uh, Chinese uh, fintech platforms like Alibaba and, and group like Tencent that, that run the entire gamut of um, financial services, right? From banking through to insurance, asset management, et cetera. Now, this is something that is not practiced in the United States. And I dare say not very prevalent in Southeast Asia either. Not at all. Now, right? Will this kind of business model work in Southeast Asia? Well, you know better than I do, um, but that is some, that is that is an uh, 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 an aspect of the innovativeness that was coming out of China. So maybe it will work. 
maybe uh, these companies uh, will have better luck in Southeast Asia, uh, again, because the regulatory environments are different um, and they are able to, they, they will be able to um, uh, leverage on the sort of the data and the technology behind all these common services. And if you are riding on that coattail, you've got a winner. That's one way of looking at it. Uh, maybe, maybe just, and um, I think we've got time for a couple more questions. So I'm just going to pivot a little bit more to Southeast Asia. Um, and I think we covered that a little bit in my um, original question. But do, it's, it's, I think people don't realize, I mean, obviously this year and more, probably the last couple of years, it's become a little bit more public that um, you know, the Chinese tech companies are here, but actually for a fact, and I recall this uh, really, really vividly, like, you know, they're like the Tencent, for example, um, they really had presence in Jakarta, Indonesia, you know, way back nearly, nearly a decade ago. It wasn't a big presence, you know, but they really had a presence. They've actually been here, um, you know, or, or rather say like, um, I think some companies have um, a physical presence, say in, in Bangkok, in Thailand as well, right? And is, this really, do they really, in your view, see Southeast Asia as the as a collective, right? And again, I say this all the time, Southeast Asia is a very, very, very fragmented market. We are 13 countries, 13 cultures, 13 languages, right? And I don't even want to break down to the different races, nationalities, and religions and everything like that. So very, very fragmented market that always gets overlooked as a collective. You know, we are a collective from an ASEAN perspective, but we are not a collective when it comes to, to habits, user habits, even food for that matter, right? Um, you know, case in point, Malaysia, Singapore, Chicken rice invention right um and it's really on that note um how how do they view southeast asia do they view southeast asia as the next frontier or are they using southeast asia as a test bit maybe you know speculatively speaking for other markets india is a huge one right africa right again africa another thing people say africa africa is huge it's even bigger than southeast asia africa is a continent right maybe is southeast asia a convenient test bit so that they can move into bigger markets, such as you know Africa, which has I thought most you know I can't remember I think it's about 55, 64 countries um, together as one, right? Southeast Asia is only thirteen. Is that is that potentially where this is going, or are they seeing Southeast Asia as the the convenient future of their business? I think the first answer, and and this is by no means a, a cop out answer. Uh, is that it's very difficult. Uh, we should not generalize Chinese tech companies as a group, right? Got it. Because they, they all have, they have, first of all, they have different products, they have different services, they've got different cultures, they have different founders with different visions. Um, I think in the past uh, year, year and a half, 18 months, you've seen a lot of Chinese companies um, emerging uh, in different parts of the world. And they all have done so for different reasons, right? Uh, Xiaomi, uh, as a smartphone maker, decided to go into India because strategically they see that uh, the handset market uh, in India is ripe for them. There are a couple of uh, uh, makers of uh, sort of a very cheap, uh, non-smart traditional mobile phones uh, out of uh, Shenzhen. Um, that have basically uh, control the uh, entire African market, the, the continental market. Uh, number, number one, number two, number three are all basically Chinese brands. But a lot of people don't know that they're actually out of, uh, out of, uh, out of uh, Shenzhen. Um, some companies have decided to go to Southeast Asia uh, for unique, unique uh, reasons uh, of their own, right? Uh, Tencent, uh, N Group, for example, has got an enterprise uh, solutions uh, business in Malaysia uh, where they provide the sort of the backbones for uh, mobile payment services out of Malaysia. Um, that's entirely part of it is, uh, I think, is, is, is accidental. Uh, part of it is organic. Um, so different companies have, have a sort of um, approach overseas expansion in different ways. Uh, Bike Dance, for example, uh, out of the blue, launch uh, TikTok in the, in the United States, and TikTok is uh, is all the rage. And uh, much earlier, uh, musically by a company called uh, Cheetah Mobile, uh, was grown and developed 
in the United States. And the very people realized that actually Musical.ly uh, was owned by a, a Chinese company uh, based out of Beijing. So uh, they all had their own you know, different reasons for, 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 for going overseas. But one thing is, is very clear. The common thread out of all this is that these companies all realize that the home market, China, is extremely competitive. Uh, if they were to maintain their you know, 15, 20% year on year growth, year after year after year, they have to look for fresh markets. They have to look for fresh fields. And based on their different products, their different visions, their different strategy, they've all decided to take a, a, a foot forward and, and go overseas. But obviously where they land has been different. Mm, interesting. Okay. Um, one last, we're almost out of time. Um, maybe let's ask one very, very, I don't think anybody has really covered it. So uh, for everybody's benefit, um, I hope we've covered most of the questions. I think we have more than 30 questions and, and most of them are literally just talking about regulations and everything. I would is like literally very curious about the regulatory front. Um, I hope everyone we've covered uh, most of, of your questions and everything you've asked. Um, if we might have missed anything out, I would really encourage you to, well, first and foremost, scmp.com, one of the best places. Um, you know, you can definitely read it. And also the Chinese Internet Report, China Internet Report, I'm sorry, is also definitely one of the places we should look at. Um, bonus question for, 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 for you guys um, at SEMP and everything, which everybody does not cover. I think Gary covered it in his, um, in his presentation at the start. Um, future of cryptocurrencies, or not just cryptocurrencies, but digital currencies. Um, next 12 months, what do you think, Eugene? Digital currencies? Yes. You're not, are you, okay, the two things here. One yes. is cryptocurrency. Okay, why not both? Okay, all right, let's yes. start with cryptocurrencies. Yes. Uh, China does not like cryptocurrencies. At all. Mining is banned. Yes. Uh, transactions have been banned uh, since 2006, I recall. Yeah. Um, initial coin offerings, no, no, right? Yep. So forget that. So uh, digital currency is a different thing, right? Digital currency, uh, the digital yuan, uh, otherwise known as the uh, central bank digital currency or the e yuan, whatever you want to call it, uh, is issued by the People's Bank of China. It is legal tender. It is fiat currency, but it is manifested in a digital form. Yep. It is being tested in several uh, major cities around China. It is increasingly being embraced. Um, if you want to be skeptical and cynical about it, you can argue that you know, digital currency has been around for as long as Alipay and Tencent WeChat Pay have been around. These are digital wallets. So what's new with the central bank uh, issuing a digital version of the yuan? Uh, it just means that the Chinese government wants to be part of this broader financial, the broader trend in fintech innovativeness. Um, Chinese people have embraced uh, digital payments and online payment like crazy. And this is another manifestation of it. Nice. Thank you very much. And I think with that, Eugene, I think that's all we have time for. Thank you very much. And thank you to your colleagues and team at SEMP as well for putting this together. Um, and everyone, once again, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for participating. Thank you for your questions, your comments and everything like that. Um, again, you can download the free version and you can also check out the pro version of the SEMP report uh, by scanning the QR codes that will be coming on the screen shortly. Uh, before you go and before you leave, everyone, and don't forget, um, we also have the feedback poll. Please, 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 um, you know, share with us your feedback. If you like the session, ultimately, you know, it's going to make us obviously do better, right? Feedback is always, always very important. With that, we've come to the end of the Green Shoots session today. We look forward to everyone joining again. Actually, literally next week, we got another session on green, actually, um, on the 30th of, um, of, of uh, September, happening next week, Thursday as well, around the same time. Um, and with that, um, QR codes as well also will link you to the series of other green shoot sessions where you're happening. Uh, last note, everyone, don't forget, I said this at the start, tickets for the upcoming Singapore FinTech Festival happening from the 8th to the 12th 
of November available now, early bird prices end in roughly two weeks time. All right. Don't and do remember to register for your tickets because if not after that, the prices go up and you know all that kind of stuff, right? Um, check us out, fintechfestival.sg. Last but not least, on behalf of the entire team at Singapore Fintech Festival, um, thank you for your time. See you next week. Stay safe and bye-bye.